was Brillig and the slimy tones, pit gyre and gimbal in the wave, all mimsy were the borrow groves and the moon rafts outgrave. KRUI 89.7 FM, Iowa City's sound alternative. Can't hear me. Or, oh, can hear okay, I think I can. I, I can hear myself. <laughs> uh, I can hear myself, but I can't hear you. Nope. <laughs> Does this one work? Hey. Yes. Oh, it's cool. Better. Okay, I can hear you now. Yeah, must be something wrong with the main mic. No. Okay. Okay, that's a great way to start the show. Hello, everyone. <laughs> You're listening to KRUI, Iowa City, eighty-nine point seven FM on the real radios and KRUI dot FM streaming online. Uh, the show is called I Hear, I See. My name is Justin Comer. This is a, a show that celebrates the local talent here in Iowa City. We also have a monthly concert series. Our next show is January 19th at the Mill at 8 p.m. Uh, more news on that as we, we fill the lineup and get everything squared away. Uh, today is a very special broadcast. We usually air at 7 p.m. on Sundays, but I had to... Uh, move this one around because of building closures during the winter break. Today I have a guest in the studio for the very first time. Her name is Christine Burke. Hello. That's Christine's voice. I think I've played her music once or twice previously, so if you're a regular listener, you are familiar with her work. Um, she is one of the aforementioned local Iowa City artists. I believe this is the first time I've ever interviewed anyone in my <laughs> life, so this will be fun. Uh, I don't have any questions prepared, so we're just kind of winging it. And, uh, yeah, welcome to the studio, Christine. Thanks, thanks. for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, let's see. To get things started, I guess I'll ask you, um, how'd you get your start as a musician? Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, well, I grew up in a moderately musical household. My mom was a pianist, and I think that probably had a lot to do with just, um, my awareness of what classical music was, and uh, we listened to a lot of Pink Floyd, Simon and Garfunkel growing up and stuff, so... Um, yeah, I knew a little bit, bit about that, and then I went through elementary and middle school kind of band programs. Um, pretty typical musical development as far as that's concerned, and then I ended up uh, continuing playing throughout school. I was a clarinetist um, and started composing around then to kind of on and off throughout my undergrad, and uh, eventually became a composition major. Came through my uh, master's in clarinet performance degree and eventually switched. Yeah, here being the University of Iowa, ah, yes. if you are... <laughs> listening abroad and aren't familiar with the radio station already. <laughs> uh, so did you start out on piano then, since your mom was a pianist? I think so. Um, <laughs> that seems right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we took, I took piano lessons with her for a little bit, and then uh, started playing clarinet and band around, like, fourth or fifth grade, yeah. I think. Um, and then started composing, and, like, my dad found finale, like a free finale software or something. We downloaded it onto my computer, and then I kind of got used to it from there. I also remember playing with like a marimba that we had in our basement. Oh, sweet. and kind of like starting to compose that way. Yeah, um, yeah. marimba is a good place to start. It was, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you you didn't uh, major in composition in your undergrad? No, I did take lessons. Um, started out with studying with uh, Scott Steele, who was a um, also a student at Duquesne at the time. Then eventually started studying with David Stock, who was his teacher for like my last year and a half at uh, Duquesne University. In Pittsburgh, but I was a clarinet major, a performance major at the time. Pittsburgh, okay. and yes. you're from Illinois. Uh, yeah. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, like okay. originally from Illinois, then moved to Indiana eventually, uh, and that's where that's where I'm like from now. From Indiana. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Got Steele. Where is he now? I think I know him. <laughs> yeah, you probably do from um, EMCC. The like, uh, he went to Kansas City for his master's degree, um, and he's working as a computer programmer now, but still. Uh, composer which is cool but yeah he was my first teacher and that was i think that, that was really great super influential yeah i think i met him at, in kansas City. yeah he's a cool guy i'm pretty sure we're facebook friends yeah <laughs> but i don't really <laughs> okay so uh clarinet major in undergrad and mm -hmm. then did a lot of composition though yeah. so what are you doing now okay so now well next week i'm gonna go to um uc davis in sacramento for a premiere of a percussion and uh guitar work wow <laughs> electric guitar. And, uh, and then coming up, I have um, two pieces I'm writing. One is for this quintet uh, by Daniel Meyer, who was 
a student at McGill, now lives in Joshua Tree, kind of in the desert in California, which is super cool. Anyway, um, so he has... album. Oh, yeah, that's also true. (laughs) Uh, So he has this quintet that's um, two guitars, trombone, percussion, and cello. So I'm going to... I'm working on a piece for them, which is like a super... That's a super cool instrumentation. Really excited about that. And then I'm working on a uh, 16-piece sinfonietta uh, work for Alarmal Sound. A nice. project in July. That's the big news, I think. Yeah, is yeah. That you got that alarm will sound gig coming up. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. About and that's that. in Missouri, right? Yeah, that'll be in Columbia, Missouri. Sweet. Um, and do you, when did you finish your masters? In May. In May. This past yeah, year. yeah. So there's mm-hmm. this year or last year now. Yeah. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, and you work at the music library. I do. Yep. Yeah. I'm a Tell library. Me about that. <laughs> I'm a library assistant at the uh, Reed Benton Music Library. <laughs> I, it's actually, it's a pretty, it's a sweet job. I just work with like recordings, uh, U- uh, University of Iowa recordings, um, uploading those to digital sites. And I've been going through a lot of uh, archived material from like past um, Center for New Music Performances, which has been super cool to see. Like they worked with Barrio and uh, I believe Rocheberg and um, you know, they played Ligeti, Cage, Feldman, like, a ton of really, really cool stuff. A lot of uh, visiting composers. They also had Copeland, although I think he was for the orchestras, not the center. That sounds like an awesome gig. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty great. So um, you're like taking old analog recordings and digitizing them? Or? Um, yeah, eventually all of the reels we have are going to be digitized. And I think the way we're working on it now is um, to focus it kind of around the Center for New Music Recordings, which is like super awesome to be working with that material specifically. But probably will also include the orchestral recordings eventually. Uh, I think that that's still kind of being worked out. But um, yeah, getting to kind of go through the history of the center like, from the recordings perspective is really cool. But we can't we can't hear any of it yet. Um, but I see all the programs. And stuff. Oh yeah, I've actually looked through those old programs at some point too. Yeah. So you're looking at tapes from like the 70s and 80s and stuff. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think I can't remember what the earliest one is. V68 or something. Um, that goes from the reels to cassette tapes and then CDs. And then, you know, now pretty much everything is just digital, but uh, it's archived really well. Cool. Uh, I think I'm going to maybe try to play a recording here. Sweet. So I, I have um, a recording of one of Christine's pieces that we performed on, I think, December 10th. That sounds right. Does that yeah. sound right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is called At a Steady Consistent Rate. It's about 10 minutes long. Uh, I played tenor sax on it remember the full credits yeah okay so let's see so um we have zachary meyer on flute jeremy moss playing uh paired and unprepared violin jaeger playing bass and then alex spenceri on euphonium playing saxophone missing two people uh oh alex woodstrand on um bassoon and did you say yourself already? oh yeah no, no i yeah. was <laughs> i was playing uh the banjo with this like evo which is a um amazing little uh device that uses an electromagnetic wave to make a string vibrate so you get kind of an attackless sound that's very nice yeah, yeah so you'll hear banjo strings but not plucked right just yeah. like uh-huh. going on the road Drony. yeah uh anything else you want to say about the piece before i start it uh yeah i would like to just mention that you know the material is entirely from performers like i had no control over what the actual material of the piece would be aside from two kind of basic stipulations um which maybe I could talk about. Yeah, sure. So it's sort of indeterminate from your perspective. Absolutely. It gives the performers more control. Okay, I'm going to see if I can remember how to start the CD. <laughs>
The ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. He's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part. SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. And we're back. Hi, Christine. Oh. Just tuning in, this is I Hear, I See, a show about Iowa City music and poetry and all sorts of art. My name is Justin Comer. I have a guest today, Christine Burke, talking about music and her life <laughs> and whatever. Not a very structured conversation. Uh, before that, Smokey Bear... PSA, we heard a recording of At a Steady Consistent Rate, which we performed on December 10th at the Boxman Music Building. Uh, Christine, you have further thoughts on that piece? Um, yeah, just to explain kind of what was happening there. Uh, it was a very open piece in terms of content. Um, I did very little uh, specifying as to the kind of material that all the performers were playing. Um, and it, it's pretty much split in half where the first half, I'm just saying play any tone just you know a norm quote-unquote normal uh long tone of some kind and then um like i was playing an e or something like yeah on my I, sax. I can't remember what i was playing <laughs> uh and then the second half which is completely in the middle of the piece um is an unstable sound that is made of kind of some simultaneous continuing action so instead of playing like you know three notes in a row it would be uh Playing and singing, which is um, something you could hear pretty distinctly at the end. Zachary was doing that on the flute. Or uh, there was the bassoon multiphonic that was being played um, that is just kind of, you know, one one sound, but it, it's an unstable one that you could hear kind of fluctuations in it. So Right. And I think he was the last one to stop playing. He was, right? yeah. So you heard that all the way to the end. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's a very distinctive sound. And then we had kind of what was going on between um, you and Alex Spenceri, who was playing <laughs> euphonium, to kind of gritty airy sounds that you were producing kind of differently but right. matched really well timbrely yeah so i was playing a tenor sax i took my mouthpiece off mm-hmm. and i was sort of making like a brass buzzy sound in tech yeah yeah of the sax uh-huh. and it just sort of like a yeah. weird scratchy kind of uh, like you're playing a trumpet wrong yeah yeah, yeah. Kind of. <laughs> um yeah and so you get this like really interesting mix of timbres at the end which end up being attributed to like the performer's individuality in a way which is right a big element of music in general is like giving the performers a certain amount of agency. Um, as my chain of thought. Do you want them to know like what the music looked like that oh, I was yeah. playing off? That's of? right. Uh, so the score that everyone was playing off of was just a series of single d- digit numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and the numbers were either uh, outlined and empty or they were solid numbers. And the empty ones just meant represent silence. The filled in ones were um, sound. Then half the second half of the numbers had a yellow uh, background behind them, which just was like this is the second half of the piece. Yeah, when we started doing the more unusual sounds, right? Yeah. And um, the idea then is that each performer decides that they're going to count through the entire piece at um, a steady rate throughout the entire thing. I mean, as much as they can, because clearly, like it's hard to do that completely uh, steadily when you have you know six other people doing it themselves, and if someone is just like you know a second faster than you it's going to be very hard to like always maintain this kind of thing but the idea was not so much that you know you have to be perfect about the whole thing because i mean that actually wasn't the idea at all it was more yeah um, you can hear that we're not playing it together yeah yeah absolutely we're all playing off of the same sheet of music Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. it's all like staggered and we're not playing at the same time (laughs) i don't know there's something Uh, clicking in here uh and so the idea basically is just getting you're getting from one place to another kind of as a group you can hear someone maybe leading or following Thing. I think it's the heat. Oh, is that what that is? <laughs> yeah, there's a vent just like clacking behind us. You can probably hear it on the mic. That's nice. Uh, yeah, so the music, it was like a series of numbers. You'll see maybe like three, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. And it alternates between a solid number and a, like an outline of a number. Exactly. Which means yeah. make a sound or don't make a mm-hmm. sound for this number of beats. Right. We're all determining our own tempos sort of yeah. <laughs> near each other, but not together. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. And it's, it's just a vehicle. Like that's. Uh, the vehicle for um, sound production, I mm-hmm. guess that's how mm-hmm. I thought of it. Uh, so, yeah, with all of these things kind of like intersecting in each piece, um, I always wonder if if this is, like, do you call this improvising, essentially? Mm-hmm. I'm never entirely sure because on one hand, like I, I have, as the composer, I have moderately 
little bit of control over what's happening. A lot of the control is given to the performers, but they are still acting within like certain um, constraints. Yeah, you you outlined the parameters, which mm-hmm. is like you gave us sort of like a list of things that we are doing. Mm-hmm. We're deciding what each sort of component is, but you gave yeah. us the instructions. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like a very think of it as kind of like controlling the performer's agency although i don't like to think of it as control although that is i think what it is in the end um i think improv that's a much like friendlier way Hmm. for me to think about it but you don't have complete freedom so yeah yeah. well there's different kinds of improvisation and say that like most jazz is really freedom Mm -hmm. in terms of improvising Mm -hmm. you know like most of it's really board based and scales and stuff Uh can't just go wild Mm -hmm. i mean there's like Ornette Coleman and even wilder stuff than that that right. does Free jazz, go yeah. into that uh-huh. realm. But most like traditional straightforward jazz is not free, but it's still improvising. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I guess, yeah, the um, yeah, har- harmonic kind of context is also a structure to work within. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think that the element of that, though, that is most attractive to me is that you end up creating something together as a group. Um, yeah. It's, it's a collective you may not want to call it improvisation, but like a collective composition. I mean, yeah, like you, yeah, no. you're the composer, but still like you're inviting input from several. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm really excited about the idea of engaging people in that way, um, especially people that I'm friends with, because it's just like a whole other kind of like social interaction, mm-hmm. or at least that's how I think of it. And when I think about how with this piece and then, you know, um, <laughs> uh, pieces by like Cage and Feldman and uh, <laughs> the clicking. Oh, it's just, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Just just the idea that it's a it's a collective creation in a way. That's really nice. How would you compare that piece to Feldman? I haven't actually like studied oh, a sure. whole lot of Feldman's uh-huh. scores, but I have listened to quite a bit of recordings. Uh, and I would say it sounds like it's in a similar realm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, actually, the first half of that piece is like, wow, like this absolutely could be a Feldman piece, <laughs> except that he like he he notate he notates actual music yeah, right. um musical notes. Uh, and the, he does have some pieces, like he has the, the graphic scores, um, things that are, are less controlled than that. But uh, Morton Feldman, Morton if Feldman, any listeners yeah. are not familiar with his music. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting, this like, it's maybe two ways of achieving the same, at least like the same sonic result, mm-hmm. but the, um, the methods are, are different. And I wonder if, I, I mean, I can't speak to his intent, but the, I think the intent is a little bit different too. Because uh, I, I do like genuinely feel that I was okay with, with any kind of result that happened in that piece. Whereas if you're notating something very specifically, you already know what you want. Yeah, I think his music, uh, even though it sounds pretty open and spacey, uh, it's pretty deterministic. Like, yeah. It's yeah. a piece that he wrote to go specifically this way. Exactly, yeah. It's not so mm-hmm. much uh, indeterminate or leaving stuff up to the performers. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, do you have other pieces that are like this? Yeah, I, I mean, this is it's, it's pretty central to my approach in general, especially in the past year and a half or so, where... I have my own ideas about the sounds I want to have, um, or, or maybe about form. And then right. there's, you know, the element of the performer's agency in all of this, which is their choices about possibly the material they're going to play or when they're going to do certain things. Um, then there's just the element of chance, you know, which kind of comes about as a result of those first two things. Or it's possible that I uh, there's something else that maybe I would write into a piece that would increase, like, the chance element a little bit more. Um, but... Yeah, pretty much everything since November or so of 2016 has been this. Yeah. And it's incredibly important to me because I feel like interacting with performers in this way, which is which is something that like I can't control each individual person. And I like that because like all of these things together are going to create something that uh, I couldn't possibly have come up with myself. Yeah. And yeah. that's like it's a way of like searching for something that is really important to me and I think is unique to like how I work with music. Yeah, I will say that the rehearsal we had for the piece was pretty fun because we were yeah. all sort of like, for the second half, we were coming up with the sounds we wanted to do and mm-hmm. like playing them for each other and sort of like just making the decisions together, like what yeah. we wanted this yeah. to sound like. Yeah, and it was a very collaborative process. Yeah, and that that's like, that is exactly what I want. Um, and and I think it changed as we kind of went through it. Mm-hmm. Um, our, our balance, like we developed our own balance, but we never really talked about it. Right, yeah, that stuff kind of comes about if you play together for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's... That's really amazing. I really like yeah. that aspect of it. So it's 2.30, which means I need to talk about the weather for a minute. Uh, hang on. The page is refreshing. Let me tell you guys what the weather's like. Uh, she's got her phone out. Are you looking it up too? Trying. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying as well. 
I have eight degrees. Uh, yeah, I also have eight degrees. It's not feeling that's that, the real though. temperature. Uh, it actually feels like negative five degrees, <laughs> so it feels awful. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty terrible. Humidity is at fifty nine percent. I don't know if that's relevant. <laughs> and there's nine mile per hour winds. Mm-hmm. Not too windy, but it's still like extremely cold. Yes. It does. Uh, all right. So now that I kind of derailed that by having to read the weather, let's play another to music. Uh, I have queued up. Another track from Jason Palomar's new album, Born With Two Brains, and this tune is called Dropped, with a zero instead of an O.
All right, that was Jason Palomara. Am I on? Man, doing good today. <laughs> it's been about a month since I've been in the studio, so a little rusty. Okay, so that uh, that music was by Jason Palomara from the album he released last month, Born With Two Brains. Uh, if you like what you heard, you can look him up. Jason Palomara, P-A-L-A-M-A-R-A. Good stuff. <laughs> I partner with him on a lot of stuff, so I like his music. We work together a lot. So now that I'm back uh, here with Christine Burke, I think we're going to keep talking about improvisation yes. because that was a good line of thought. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're talking about your piece and how it's it's not quite improvisation by your standards. Right. Well, yeah, it's a question. Um, it's a question. I'm not I'm not entirely sure because there is there are definitely elements to it. But mm -hmm. I think it's still I think it's very controlled. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's there's different kinds, different levels of improvisation. Yeah. Say. Course, like yeah. different levels of freedom mm -hmm. on the performer's part. Uh, you have you have a composition, but there are elements to it that are open exactly. to decision making mm -hmm. by whoever's performing it. Whereas a lot of what I've been doing the past couple of years is like no direction. Sure. You just free. start from scratch and see what happens. Interesting. Which is kind of kind of risky if you're uh -huh. performing in front of an audience because most audiences are not necessarily on board with sure. uh -huh. where you end up going. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> well when it takes like I think it takes a considerable amount of patience on performer's part to do like a good, um, just not that you're just going to do absolutely anything or like the first thing that comes to mind or like, do you think about, do you think of a trajectory or is there like a point you're headed to or is it stream of consciousness? Yeah. What I like to do majority of the time, I think is like decide on a starting point, especially if I'm working with other people and not like solo improvisation, mm -hmm. uh, like you around were you in town when I was doing stuff with the compromisers? Yeah, I think that was okay. that was just when I got here. Okay, that I was think. a group that Emma and I and Will Huff uh -huh. and Andrew Jerutsa started together. Uh -huh. I don't I don't know if you know no, everyone except Andrew. Andrew, okay. He was a jazz guitarist. Okay. He I don't remember where he moved to, but <laughs> he does not live here anymore. Uh and that that was like a free improv ensemble with like mm -hmm. open membership mm -hmm. that we had for um, like a year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. And so, like, whoever wanted to play was allowed to come out with us. And we played at a lot of the I Hear I See shows in, like, 2014 and 15. Mm -hmm. uh, but what what I like to do, it's sort of, I became, like, the de facto leader of it when the other guys moved away and sure, yeah. started participating uh -huh. less. Uh, and we'd sort of, like, decide on, like, a few elements before we started. Like, this piece is going to start fast mm -hmm. and soft. Cool, like, yeah. some other idea mm -hmm. like that. And so we start together with, like, fast like pulse thing maybe uh -huh. that's quiet uh -huh. and then just sort of go in whatever direction sure. uh -huh. we feel like uh and after the starting point might be just like stream of consciousness i don't sure. know <laughs> no i mean i think there's something so interesting to the stream of consciousness part of it which especially for um you know like the classically trained musicians in a way it's like so you're either kind of drawing on um all this knowledge and information you already have from years and years of uh, practicing right it's not like a totally random like any sound in the universe is right. just gonna uh -huh. flow through me it's yeah obviously i'm influenced by everything i've done before yeah right yeah uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. um but because you're well in the case of like interacting with other people though mm. that becomes even more interesting because you have then several people doing that uh but you know moments can happen that are entirely new yeah the collective experiences of everybody that you're playing yeah. are yeah. all mm -hmm. at play yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and we amazing. let's see. I did a few of these with Joe Norman uh -huh. on guitar, so he has like a metal background, mm -hmm. and Nima has like a traditional Iranian Persian music background. Mm -hmm. um, John Wilson played a lot of them, and he mm -hmm. has he has the classical and like an experimental electronic mm -hmm. background, and all of it just sort of mixes together. Yeah, and we I mean really the key is just listening to each other, right? And yeah. like playing off of each other. Uh -huh. um, but it's like. I don't know. It's really hard to explain how how that works. Like you're listening right. to what someone else is doing, and then you just like intuitively participate in what they're mm -hmm, doing mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which which makes for a very interesting like formal experience too. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how these things like when you um you will and Carlos uh, improvise together at uh, one of the the December I hear I yes. see show. Uh, that group is called Wombat. I'm now. sorry. Yes, yes Wombat. That's the <laughs> title of that project. Um, so yeah, Wombat. The Wombat performance. Uh, remember oh, actually no i'm curious did you have a starting point for that or did you um, talk about that before that was a little different because that group um the sort of beginning of that was that we were playing 
as the musical accompaniment to like a spoken word right yeah. sort of piece um but it was bigger than that it was we had like poetry just uh writing that's not poetry prose, prose. <laughs> thank you prose <laughs> uh, stuff um there was a dancer there that was improvising as well mm-hmm. so it's a lot of interacting elements yeah, yeah yeah and and it was like an hour long piece yeah. And we were making music for most of that. Mm-hmm. So there are times when like we are background accompaniment to the spoken word stuff. There are moments where we were the focus, like we were playing, nothing else was happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were places where the dancer was dancing to our music mm-hmm. or not. There were moments of silence completely. Mm-hmm. So there was a sort of, we got formal ideas from playing that a few times together. Mm-hmm. And then we just like had... Uh, like a library of sounds that we had been doing sure, with this yeah. project. So then that previous experience went into that performance mm-hmm. at I Hear I See. So it's, and what we, we were doing was Carlos had his electric guitar through a couple of pedals mm-hmm. and was sort of the starting point. Yeah. Just like him making noises with that. Yeah. And that yeah. sort of gives it a, a bed to jump off of. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a reference point in a way, or at least, mm-hmm. um, some sort of starting material. Yeah, and then I yeah. just come in with like a sax breath sound uh-huh, uh-huh. Kind of growing out of that. Yeah. Yeah. That, and the, your like ambral kind of, for lack of a better word, journey like throughout that piece. Uh, you can't, I mean, unless you like talk about it explicitly, which it doesn't sound like you did. Um, Not as far as I remember. Like, but yeah. Right. Well, if formally it, it's like, well, how do you, you know, who makes the decision when to change? And one person might change, but that doesn't mean you necessarily have to follow them. Mm-hmm. And you know, patience and restraint become an incredibly important element, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, I would say restraint was like my main activity yeah. <laughs> during that <laughs> performance. Because I, I didn't really like jump out much at uh-huh. all. It was uh-huh. like very textural. Yeah, yeah, sounds. absolutely. Yeah, Not just like wild non-Zorn solos. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which I have also done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, to like, to the three of you to really blend like that was... Really yeah. cool. And actually, for reference, uh, I'm pretty sure I played most of that, about half of that performance in the previous episode of this show. So we're talking about stuff that I played on the show. So you can go to the previous episode okay. and listen to it if you reference are point. interested. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what, what's your experience with that sort of improvisation where there's not uh, any sort of structural right. base? So, so actually, when I was at Duquesne, um, there was a group of, it was me and three other people that on like, Thursday nights that... 10 p.m. when uh, the recital hall, when there was no one in the recital hall, we would get together and do stuff like that. Or um, actually, one time we did it with like in the percussion studio, which was amazing because lots of toys, all yeah, so yeah. many toys. Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, and actually, Scott Steele was involved in that as well. Um, I remember doing some like where we would say everybody has to play the same note mm-hmm. and kind of see or like that. That was kind of the first compromisers piece, actually. Okay, we, all, yeah. we all played E. Nice, sort of. Yeah structural ideas for that well and that that's like the i don't i'm i don't know who this is attributed to necessarily but like you know you've heard this quote that's like restraint for its creativity essentially mm-hmm. um which i don't always agree with but then i think in a case like this it's like well yeah, yeah if, you're if not you going to be stagnant probably mm-hmm. if you can only play one pitch i mean you You'll don't just want to do that right. in one uh-huh. way static for 20 minutes or right whatever. yeah yeah exactly. you want to find ways to make that interesting yeah yeah, yeah. and and then also, you know, subtle variation becomes very interesting. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so yeah, I did I did that for uh, the improvising at Duquesne, probably a semester. And I remember thinking then, too, it's like, wow, this is like, you know, I couldn't have composed something like that. Right. But I was like uh, involved in the creation of it, which is a really interesting uh, kind of conflict. I remember like at the time being like, I don't know how to deal with this. Right. Like listening to the recordings and being like, oh, my gosh, like, I don't even know what's happening yeah. or if it's whatever like you know things are coming together here um i've actually not thought about that until now that's interesting uh but i think that was probably a very like formative experience back then mm-hmm. um but then after that once i we were kind of you know not doing that anymore i didn't really uh, i think i did some jazz improvisation sometimes but i don't know much about it other than you know just trying to follow chord changes and then um there have been times like in practice rooms here that i've done that kind of stuff just as a way of like exploring trying to find um 
sounds on certain instruments that I don't play, like harp or something. Oh, yeah. I'd spend like an hour just uh, improvising, like with the intent of flooring. Of learning. About yeah. The instrument. yeah. Yeah. For and that's, that's really good. material for your pieces. Right. But, but to do it in front of an audience, though, that's entirely different. Yeah. It's, a, it's definitely a yeah. different experience because uh-huh. there's, there's a sort of pressure there that you want to play something interesting. Right. Yeah. To yeah. People of outside mm-hmm. of your body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, because I think that's probably something, like, if you're composing, you deal with that, too. That's like, how am I mm-hmm. going to make this? Or, like, is it interesting? Do I care if it's interesting to someone else? Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, yeah, it's it's more of a social pressure than, like, an artistic pressure. Yeah, of course. You, you can just write music that's only interesting to yourself. Yeah, Why of course. Not? But you have a lot of time to deal with that, like, conflict. And if you're just, if you're composing and spending a lot of time writing, but when you're sitting in front of a bunch of people who are all looking at you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where the pressure mounts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got to play a grant spot real quick. Okay. Support for Care UI is brought to you in part by The Broken Spoke. They offer new and used bicycles, cycling accessories, and also service all kinds of bikes. They can be found in Iowa City at their new address, 757 South Gilbert Street. For more information, visit thebrokenspoke.com or call 319-338-8900. <laughs> This is the last five minutes or so of the I Hear, I See radio show. My name is Justin Comer. 
Um, my guest for today is Christine Burke. We've been talking about uh, her musical background, her musical future a little bit, <laughs> the near future. Yes. Uh, and sort of the nature of improvisation. Um, the music that you just heard is by me and my friends Chris Emery, David Clare, and Roland Hart. Uh, it's from an album we released last month called The Omnidimensional Microphone. It's a two part album. That track is called Phase Three Sydney's Blaze. <laughs> Don't think too hard about it. Doesn't actually mean anything. Um, so we were talking during the break there. Um, I think we're gonna spend the last couple minutes talking about electronics and mm-hmm. music. Uh, we don't really have enough time to go into like a really detailed discussion of it. So this is like a primer, I yeah. guess, for our experiences with electronics. Uh, so let's start with that piece that you played. Yes, by I, Lucia. Yeah. So this um, for clarinet, E flat clarinet, and then sine wave. Uh, it's a 20 minute long piece that uh, you have to have uh, through Max or pure, pure data or something similar. Um, yeah, which are like music programming languages. Yes, uh, something that will generate a sine wave. It uh, goes from the very lowest um, note of the clarinet up to around the highest. Uh, so this is a glissando that lasts 20 minutes and the clarinet comes in and out um, playing in at a unison starting point at any point of the glissando mm-hmm. and this is this is notated so it's like at um 10 minutes and 20 seconds i'm playing uh e5 or something so i might match it at first i maintain e5 and the glissando is going up very slowly so you start to hear these like beating pan- right, beating right. patterns that um come come about kind of as like it's an acoustic phenomenon essentially mm-hmm. and you hear it if you're playing like if you're you know not in tune with someone right, you'd hear right. the same thing yeah the the clarinet timbre is very similar to a sine wave. Yes. So you yeah. can like match it exactly. Yeah. And, and you yeah. pretty much mm-hmm. can't hear that there's two things going on right. until mm-hmm. they start diverting from each other. Yeah. And the, so the, and the rate of the beating changes. And I think you you hear difference tones sometimes depending on like um, about where you are in the piece. And then also like the room, the acoustics of the room play into it yeah. as well. Uh, sometimes it gets like uh, kind of bounced off. Wall or something i'm not exactly sure of the science of it <laughs> acoustics, but you start yeah. to hear like all these other things and it's it's such a simple piece but like really brilliant mm-hmm. and that's a lot of um Lucie's right music. uh alvin is this alvin person, right? yeah, yeah alvin and... lucier uh lucier whatever i, I you know. I'm honestly it's not french sure. right <laughs> i think it seems like it should be yeah um he <laughs> is i think his most well-known piece is i'm sitting in a room yes that's how mm-hmm. i know him mm-hmm. uh which is all about room acoustics yeah uh let's see we've got about two minutes um Pretty much everything I do is with electronics mm-hmm. now. So <laughs> do you have any specific questions I can answer? Uh, yeah. I mean, so what's your starting point there with something that's so expansive? Yeah. You can do anything. Open. Yeah. yeah. If you want, you could do anything really. Depends on how much time you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll just talk about really briefly. Um, Jason Palmar, who I played early in the show, he and I have a collaborative project called JCJP, which mm-hmm. I've also played on the show before. Um, and the album that we released late 2016, uh, the we started with a two-hour recording of Jason and I improvising together at my house, and it's mostly like acoustic. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of the starting point for more electronic themed pieces. Mm-hmm. We use that as the material mm-hmm. for sort of like tape pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, um, I have a, a tune on that album called "The Arc of the Moral Universe Is Long, but It oh, Bends yeah, yeah, Towards yeah. Justice." That's yeah. the very sax solo mm-hmm. we were talking about. Uh, and in that, I just found like a really nice few seconds in that acoustic recording that mm-hmm. i liked uh and i just loop it mm-hmm. as sort of the drone that's happening under my solo there mm-hmm. so it's it's looping i've got like a reverb patch that it's going through and i do most of my work in max um I have it so that loop play forwards and backwards oh, okay so it's not just repeating the uh-huh. same two seconds over and over exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. It sort of randomly decides whether it's going to go forwards or backwards, okay. which adds a little bit of complexity to the drone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I made Barry Sax over it. Uh, I added a drum beat to it, and I did some pitch shifting stuff yeah. at the beginning and end. So mm-hmm. it sort of sends mm-hmm. from a higher pitch to where it drones, and then at the end it does the opposite. Right. It goes back okay. up to where it started. So... Uh, 3 p.m., which means it's about time for us to stop. Uh, do you want to come back sometime and do this again? Yeah, totally. I feel like there's more we could talk about. Absolutely. Our electronics conversation was only five minutes. Yeah. So there's <laughs> there's a lot longer. more we can get into. <laughs> I just barely explained something. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, at some point, Christine will be back on the show. Yeah. It was fun having a guest. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, 
if you like what you heard today, the show's called I Hear, I See. Um, at some point, I'm going to get back into a regular schedule of doing this at 7 p.m. on Sundays. It's not going to be tomorrow, and it's not going to be next week, but <laughs> school starts up again. It'll be easier to get in and out of this building. Um, and if you want to hear the previous episodes, uh, go to our website, IHearIC.com. The link's at the bottom uh, to all the previous episodes. And if you want to see what we do in our concert series, our next one's going to be January 19th at the Mill, 8 p.m., and we'll have one every month after that for a few months. So that'll be it. See you next next week, probably. Uh, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, all that stuff, and keep up with what we do. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for listening. You're listening to the University of Iowa's student-run radio, 89.7 FM.